Welcome to the Tuesday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 568. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 21st of January, 2019. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. It's a fun program to do, but we just spent the chaos of working through all the technical issues that we worked through all all week long just to get this program up and running across the pond between uh, England and America. Uh, Gavin had issues, George had issues, I had issues, and you know what solves it all the time? Rebooting. But you can't tell people that because I would be unemployed as an IT professional if people knew that they just had to reboot their computer to fix their uh, IT issues. So don't tell nobody. That's a secret you get as an Anglican Unscripted viewer. I need you to help us out. We want Facebook and YouTube to know how important this show really is. And you can do that by clicking the little thumbs up icon at the bottom of your screen there, whether you're on Facebook or whether on YouTube. Also, you need to share this program. We cover hundreds of topics each year. And at some point, there's going to be a topic that you want to share. Just do it. Click that URL and share it with your friends. We, we appreciate that. Only 50% of the, of the people who watch this show are subscribed. I can't explain that. It's not like you guys don't know how to click red buttons. It's You can't be afraid of the red button unless you watch a lot of dystopian sci-fi and the red button means nuclear. No, the red button on Facebook means you are subscribed. Click it. The bell pops up. Are you afraid of the bell? You might be afraid of the bell. You click the red button. The bell pops up. You click the bell and you're subscribed for life to Anglican Unscripted. You'll be notified whenever we put up a new episode. All right, I said my now, piece. Now, Gavin, we've... Oh, okay, Kevin, I'm sorry. Kevin. Kevin. Really? <laughs> do I look like we a had, lame person? Oh, I do. <laughs> well, we had one. You were in Australia. said, I don't want to just subscribe because if you put out a show, it's usually 3 a.m. my time when it's sorry. 3 p.m. your time. And I don't want to be waking up, woken up by all these bells and whistles and noises. What does notification mean? <laughs> notification means you will get a bell on your uh, browser here or you'll get an email little uh, update it won't beep on your phone unless you have some weird phone that's not an iphone you you must have an iphone if you're in australia and if you have an iphone with the latest software you can make it so that no notifications occur between 10 p.m and 8 a.m that's a setting that i have so i can sleep peacefully but i don't sleep peacefully because the anglican communion is in chaos chaos i say because the primates had a meeting with Justin Welby called a primates meeting. And I thought you could bring us up to speed on that, George. Last week, uh, 33 of the primates attended the primates meeting hosted by Archbishop Justin Welby and accompanied by Johnson Tom with the Archbishop of York. They met in Amman, Jordan. They were there for three days. Four primates, the seats are vacant or there was illness or visa issues, did not attend. Three did not attend Nigeria, Rwanda, Uganda, out of protest over the presence of the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada. And the news reports coming out of the meeting itself were rather discouraging for a traditionally minded person because the picture painted by the Anglican Communion News Service and on social media was one of sort of pan-Anglican bonhomie of uh, Facebook's selfies and snaps of people who had been on different sides of the issues of human sexuality, all yucking it up around a coffee table with a bottle of beer. And what are we, what are we to think of what happened? Well, we've been putting out our feelers and trying to figure out what's happened. And I'll cut to the summary. It was a bad outing for GAFCON. It was a bad outing for the Global South in bad meaning in political ter in terms of political capital the three factors seem to be at play here the strongest gafcon leaders those vocal those who are pushing the hardest were absent the structure of the meeting of 33 men gathered uh, 32 men and one woman gathered uh in the closed room 
Each of them has only a few minutes to speak on their own, and they raise their their domestic issues. And the, then the conversation flows from the discussion raised over domestic issues. So the way the structure was set up was there really wasn't an opportunity to talk about pan-Anglican issues, but uh, opportunities to talk about Solomon Islands is quite concerned about sea level change because of global warming. The uh, church in South Sudan is quite concerned about civil war. Uh, so that the, the, the way that the tracks were laid for the meetings organization was away from any uh, common moral or ethical teachings. And third, uh, there's just a, uh, a weakness in the way these structures are set up as far as the conservatives are concerned. When you have Henry Arambi and uh, Peter Akinola in a room, they, are, they were such, they are, they're not dead, but they were such charismatic leaders that they could impose by the force of their personality a party whip so that everybody who supported their views jumped in line. Uh, those primates are absent from these meetings. I think those are who we would assume would exercise a leadership position uh, did not do so at this meeting. Now, I don't know for sure, but the American Anglican Council, who's shown up to previous primates meetings and gatherings and, Lam and Lambeth conferences, is usually there with supporting documents and uh, holding uh, side meetings to keep the primates and the new primates up to speed on what's been happening in pan-Anglican terms. I don't know if they were there supporting this one or not. Uh, hopefully somebody will let us know. But the dyna dynamics are so much different. So many of these primates are new. They don't have the... Uh, the muscle memory of uh, past primates and uh, uh, past primates meetings to know what the politics of the Church of England really work like and the politics of Anglican communion really work like. So, you know, here's my biggest thing to say in all this. GAFCON, if you're going to call people not to go to the meeting, you can't care about what happens at the meeting. That's, you know, that's my, my say on that. The Peer pressure among the primates is a very, and among bishops, is a very, very strong factor. Here, the peer pressure was to show a, a display of unity. That's what the leader, Justin Welby, has been pushing. That's what the staff under Josiah Wadawa Faron is pushing. That's how the structure was set up so that we could come to a common statement that we all agree on these things. And so what we'll, we'll see is when there's weak conservative leadership, the conservatives present will fall in line. I remember at Lambeth 98, there was weak liberal leadership. Jack Spong was effectively neutralized by his outrageous statements at the start of the meeting, such that at the final vote on human sexuality, we had uh, American bishops who had been ordaining gay clergy, who had been quite vocal, including... Uh, Horace J. J. Walker, the Bishop of Long Island, uh, who of many, many uh, salacious stories are told, he voted with the majority uh, uh, condemning homosexual behavior. Now, that was purely peer pressure. I can recall, because I was watching my bishop at the time, John Howe, how was he going to vote? And Walker sat directly in front of him, and Howe's hand and Walker's hand went up at the same time. Uh, so peer pressure in these uh, surroundings really will change the dynamic of how the vote comes out. So on one level, this is very discouraging uh, uh, that the political game is being lost at the, this particular hand of or around. But on a deeper level, God is still in charge. Truth is still truth. And we just have to realize that the Antichrist is at work in the church. I know that sounds hokey. I don't want to sound like some flat earth fundamentalist. But truly, uh, I believe that the Antichrist is at work see seeking to sap and destroy Christianity from within. That's how the book of Revelation tells us it'll be. Yeah, we have evidence to show that over the last uh, uh, <clears throat> 2,000 years as well. 
Um, Gavin, you're over there quiet. Uh, <laughs> Did I wave a red flag of the Antichrist in front of you, Gavin? Are you going to charge that? I don't know. No, I, I agree with, I, George, I agree with your metaphysics and your spiritual analysis. I, I was I, I was thinking about the Anglicanism I used to, to adhere to and, and wondering how much of what you've been describing um, is due to an ecclesial deficit or a structural a structurally theological problem. Um, and I, was th I, mean, I think what you're saying is that if the Archbishop of Canterbury is politically and psychologically strong enough, he can whip people into line by, by pressure. And it occurs to me that's not the best way of doing church. Um, and I, I always thought that if the Conservatives in the Anglican Communion didn't set up their own Anglican Communion, the danger would always be they would be subsumed into the liberal, uh, into, into the liberal and political hegemony or dominance of Welby. So I, I'm not surprised to hear what you say. I think it's very sad. And I fear for GAFCON and not in a not in a, a reprimanding way, but because uh, I think that one of the things history also teaches us is that it's immensely hard to reform organizations, um, large organizations that that, that uh, um, uh, from within and, and you either have to have some an enormous revolution or you have to leave and start another one. And I I think what you described in terms of the Anglican Communion shows the build-up to the Lambeth Conference is going well as far as Welby is concerned. And the reason that's a problem is that the Anglicanism Welby is trying to pursue is one that is consistent with the spirit of the age. And that, as you rightly say, becomes more and more anti-Christian. If, if I could say something outrageous, I always do. Usually it's <laughs> offensive and demeaning to people. <laughs> The, this, one of the things that strikes me as sad is the degree in which leaders of both sides are willing to close their eyes to f personal corruption, financial corruption, moral corruption among allies so that the South Indian church will be cultivated by both sides of the, uh, of the uh, fight and both sides know full well that the church is corrupt or will put up with African corruption in Central Africa or in Tanzania and other places just so that this guy votes the right way. And I know that at GAFCON bishop meetings, corruption is a major topic of the church must rid itself of fiscal corruption, of the abuse of power, of the creation of king, god, emperor, bishops that bishops who will have the charism of episcopacy, not the charis charism of the big chief. And this may seem this may seem naive, but I think fighting the top level political battles, as Gavin says, while the ecclesiology is not set, and while we're willing to compromise on moral deeper issues, um, means that we're never going to have a, a satisfactory answer. One of these things that uh, people keep raising is the ordination of women. GAFCON is very divided, mm -hmm. and it will not make a decision because we have some groups, uh, the Nigerians being one province and very strong sections of the American Anglican Church in North America, adamantly opposed for theological and, and all these reasons, uh, cultural and traditional reasons. And then we have the Ugandans and the Kenyans who, and the Rwandans uh, who are and strong sections of the American church who are very much in favor. And the mm -hmm. success of the Anglican church in North America in temporal terms is that they have been able to live with this tension. But can we build a worldwide movement of reform while the and and, and say, okay, we're going to ignore this tension, but we're going to address that tension. It, this is more a, a philosophical argument, I guess, but I don't know if the time has come really to be clear about where we stand on all these issues. Can I can I offer a bit of a bit of musing during this this week because it 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 comes. I was wondering if I'd be able to share it, and George gives me a platform to do that. Um, I got a phone call from the uh, main reporter of the, of the uh, Sunday Times the other day, who said I haven't heard from you, and we had a chat. It was his day off, and so we we talked. Um, he's a rather eccentric man, uh, and he 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 said, Gavin, whenever I talk to to people in the in the in the church, they always go on much too long with technical terms, and I need very short sentences with ordinary language. And you're not bad at that, so you know, 
please do that. Just explain to me, he said, very briefly, what is it that Christianity brings to the table in our present culture? Just in just in one sentence. <laughs> one sentence. Else, <laughs> what does the well, Bible mean in one sentence? Yeah, no, but it was good <laughs> because I, I thought as rapidly as I could, and I said, the real division today in our culture, and George, this is this is addressing the ordination of women for for, for the for ACNA, ultimately. The, the real division in our church today, conceptually, is that you identify your, your value and your identity is either, either defined by your membership of a group or in terms of individual sanctity. Um, in other words, the, the, the person in the Judeo-Christian tradition is the sanctified entity. You matter because you're a person, an individual with a soul. Now, we, we, assume this, we assume this is normal. But, but, but feminism, uh, the gay movement, the whole madness of crowds scenes, racism itself, all these issues of identity politics change the emphasis from moving your value from being an individual who's morally accountable to belonging to a group. And the great problem with racism is the moment you're accused of it, you lose any personal autonomy. You are simply, uh, it's checking your credentials as to whether or not you have got your groups right in a right relationship with each other. Your group isn't looking down on another group. Now, the problem with the women issue, that there are many, of course, layers to the ordination of women, but one of the most important ones is that it's feminism. And what feminism is doing is saying, we want to identify, present ourselves in this organization as a group. Uh, and what we're interested in doing is, is understanding our relationship in terms of power. So you have two universes, one in which the, the individual is absolutely essential and accountable before God, and the other in which you belong to a group and your language is not love, um, but, but it's power. Now, the, the problem at the moment is as the church tries to straddle this, if the battle between these two philosophical spiritual systems was evenly balanced, well, it may be the church could ride two horses at once, but it's a bit like Arianism in the early centuries. Um, you can't have a mixed economy theologically where one of them works to undermine revelation. And so uh, belonging to a group, understanding things in terms of power relations, and, and above all, replacing patriarchy with matriarchy, is going to take the church down a, a route which is away from Christ and away from the Holy Trinity. And so I, I, don't, I don't think the church, I would urge ACNA to stick to apostolic and biblical principles and not try and do the splits over the chasm between our present, the vest of the last edges of Judeo-Christian culture and the beginning of woke and identity culture. It can't be done. And at some point the church will fall flat on its face and dislocate its hips and wish it had kept to apostolic biblical tradition. So that I think is the issue that they should be facing. No disagreement here. <laughs> Back to Kevin. All right. Yeah. Uh, part, part. Uh, this is not a disagreement with Kevin, but sort of a uh, well, taking it one step forward. And an, an added layer of this difficulty is that Gavin has articulated so very thoughtfully and very well a primary concern that, for instance, I don't really share in the sense that I hate. I hate to put it in that way. It's not that it's unimportant, but in my hierarchy of issues, the ordination of women ranks fairly low. I mean, it's ranks, but it is much lower than, say, personal holiness. And part of the and Gavin's issues about ecclesiology and actually what happens at the Eucharist and what is the ontological status of the priest, I guess, coming from the tradition that I do, is much lower than, than other issues. So everything Gavin says I agree with, but those aren't the ditches I want to die in. And part of the problem we're having is it we're having in the broader Anglican sense is that we don't have the same priorities. Uh, we do on a sort of a uh, macro uh, on a macro level where we yes we you know the creeds and the Trinity and all this and that, but when we actually get down into the ditches and the day to day work, we have different priorities. It's, you know, people say, how can you be an Episcopalian when X, Y, and Z happen in your national church? And I say, well, that has nothing to do with me. I'm in my local world doing what I need to be doing and being faithful to the faith once received. And, well, and let's stop right there. The faith once received, some of these African nations that ordain women, that is the faith they received. 
They received the faith from the people who came to the country that said women's ordination is perfectly natural within the biblical realms of spreading the gospel. Nothing wrong with it. And it flows and, into their cultural norms to begin and, with. And so that is the faith they received. And there's, yeah, you know, but that, that we have a Genesis problem there because <laughs> that, that means the error occurred hundreds of years ago. It's not the error, uh, it's the error we're living with today, if, if an error at all. But with respect, Kevin, that, that it isn't true. That isn't the faith that was once received. That this was the faith that's been invented since 1960. Uh, I mean, the first woman to be ordained was ordained just after the war, and for, uh, for for practical reasons. So it's the faith that's only been existing in one generation. It's not the faith once received. It's it's the most recent. Um, it's the most recent important evolution. George, I would say that this is a bit like going on a journey in a car, and uh, you know, the, 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 our waypoints. Uh, are the same, but the real problem is the destination is different. And so, if you, have, it, it, in my understanding, if you have women's ordination, you find you're going to a different place. So you and I may have the same waypoints for the next ten or fifteen years, and it looks like we're traveling on the same journey, going to the same place. But actually, the church that has women's ordination built in will move toward in a relativistic, syncretistic direction, because feminism has imported all of those philosophical uh, and, and values, hierarchical values from the secular culture, which take us away from the essentials of Christian faith. And, and how do we know that? Well, actually, your, your church is the best example. It's the, be it's the pioneer of the whole thing. And, and, and look, look where it's been going uh, and the values it's been um, embodying and uh, the way in which it's done, it's done the gospel. So I, I think it's more a matter if we were to move this into a green agenda, it's a bit like saying the dustmen haven't come and emptied my bin bags and I've, I've, I've got rats at the bottom of my garden, while somebody is also saying if you insist on not cutting down on plastic, you will start eating plastic when you have fish and chips. They're both true and you can't afford to, to concentrate on one without the other. So and, let's trans and, and Gavin, I would say, well, I'm just making a compost pile. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. Let, I'm let's taking a third option. Let's transition here and talk about some of the major issues the primates show up with to a primate meeting. Uh, we had a attack in Nigeria where a leader of the church there was beheaded this week, or I don't know how he was beheaded, but the videotape was re released, and um, that's real issues in places like Sudan, Nigeria, and other parts of uh, Africa that the primates show up and say, you know, Pan American Anglican issues aren't the big game. I have to fight Islam. I have to fight the uh, radical imams in my country who want to kill me. That's my number one priority. I have to fight the radical Buddhists if I live yeah. in Ceylon or in Myanmar. Sure. I have to fight the radical secularists if I live in uh, in France. Uh, in uh, well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, you're right. In other words, the pressing local concerns for the vast majority of Anglican churches, that the gay issues are a Western phenomena. And if you're in a church in the uh, less developed world, um, these are not pressing local issues. Survival is the issue. Relations uh, with a hostile government or a hostile culture. And so when they come to these meetings, uh, you know, the primate of Mexico uh, will come and he'll talk about the horrendous toll that crime and drugs are taking on his people. Uh, there's a Facebook page, post the other day, the Bishop of Southern Mexico, Mexico posted a post that the young adult son of one of his priests was found dead with their hands bound, shot in the back of the head. This, this man was just a student and a bunch of students were just executed for being in the wrong time, the wrong place in uh, in Mexico. And so for a Mexican archbishop or Mexican presiding bishop, the homosexual issue, the feminist issue, they're like, yes, 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 I agree with all that Gavin says, but my people are dying. Okay, Help me. George, I'd like, I'd like to make I, a I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making a value judgment, I'm just saying what they're doing. And that's I one example of what they're doing. I understand that. What I think one of the one of the ways we might join the dots up between the two circumstances, and it's very difficult, not at all easy. But I, the, the the problem is that the church in the West, where it is strongest, has been completely silenced by relativism and groupthink. In other words, we can't tell the truth about about Islam. 
we're not able to say you need to be long you you as part of our evangelism you need to believe in jesus because if you don't believe in jesus you'll get muhammad and and muhammad and islamic culture and sharia law are, are, not, are not very good for you uh, and you need to believe in jesus and, and and give money to evangelistic agencies who make societies christian one of the things we can't do in in africa at the moment is to support the christian communities there by speaking vociferously about the dangers of islam because we, we are tied by the philosophy and the theology that i was talking about earlier i'm not sure i can draw a, a, a line from this into social uh, anarchy and chaos in in mexico but i but up until now, one of the ways in which places have become more civilized, better run and more accountable is on the back of the gospel. But if you can't spread the gospel because it, is, it, it becomes hate speech in terms of political agencies or people who might have been supportive to your ventures, then the world is a darker and more dangerous place. The causality is, is, is not immediate, but I still think it's linked. So I, I want to make a case for saying that if you can't, if we cannot resist woke culture that turns Christianity into hate speech, then alternative, alternative social models like 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 anarchy and like Islam uh, will have more freedom because because people being uh, hospitable to the presence of Jesus in their lives will will be reduced, and only Jesus keeps these these things at bay. Well, the well the. the the force and the evil within the world culture isn't just taking out Christians. They're taking out everybody who has a Western reasonable sense of government and politics. Uh, in France, uh, there was a recent verdict where a man through free speech, he's a, a French philosopher who said, hey, listen, I don't know if you noticed this yet, but we're being invaded by Islam. Same with England and other parts of Europe, it's, it's an invasion. And he was taken to court and he's sentenced to three months uh, because of his opinion and because France doesn't have free speech like America. And this is the whole culture taking on anybody uh, that would stand up and have any reason to their voice. You're absolutely right, Kevin. And I'm torn because I want to say 30 different things so apologies because I'm going to say the wrong thing this gets I think this takes me back to Gavin's uh, discussion of the ecclesial deficit within Anglicanism now by this I don't I'm not talking about the validity of orders or anything but what is the point of a primates meeting what is the point of a Lambeth conference in other words, we have these higher order issues of ethics, of morals, all the issues that Gavin has been raising that need to be addressed, fighting back against the corruption and the death culture that surrounds us. But the choice that these leaders are given is we can talk about murder in Mexico or we can talk about higher level issues. You've got 10 minutes, go. And the way the structures are set up is the path of least resistance, the path that when you go back men are fallen and corrupt and are usually lazy people and I'm not saying anyone is a lazy archbishop but when you go home and you talk to your brother brother and sister bishops and say what did you all talk about they want to hear that you talked about the thing that is pressing them personally and they also want to hear you talked about the major issues but the way our system is structured we have no pan-anglican groups that have any meaning that have any heft, that have any respectability. The Archbishop of Canterbury is a busted flush. The Anglican uh, Consultative Council is a joke. The primates meeting are easily neutered. And the Lambeth conferences, as we have seen in the last 25 years, can be led by the nose, uh, by the best organized uh, political machine. What does that, and here's Gavin's, here's what I heard Gavin saying, what does that say to us about this sort of church that it can be so manipulated by the human structures and human weaknesses and here's the big juxt of it all lambeth has an opportunity to get together all the bishops in the church and say hey we're going to help you reach the culture for christ or we're going to help you teach your church about climate change 
this this reaching the culture for Christ is so important. We had a we had a, a very exciting moment in uh, our current affairs this last week, as people have been discussing Meghan Markle and uh, on Question Time, an actor called Lawrence Fox, uh, who is not of the left. I don't think that makes him right, but he's not of the left. Uh, he was asked whether or not he thought Meghan's discomfort uh, was caused by racism. And, and he said no, that actually um, British society was the most uh, relaxed and accepting society in the world. He was nearly right. Apparently the Swedes are... are, are the the on, Swedes. The Swedes. French aren't bad either, but yeah. But we're, well, no, we're only beaten by the Swedes in, in terms of social science, if you believe in social science, but let's believe in it today. It suits us. Uh, social science tells us that we are the second most accepting heterodox culture uh, in the world. So it's not likely, said Fox, that Meghan was driven out by racism, whereupon a woman in the BBC audience who was a professor of, of, of black studies called him out and said, you're a racist, you are a white privileged man and you wouldn't know racism. And he said, stop it, you're being racist for calling me a racist, which is, is logically true. Yeah, uh, true. Th then, then his Twitter feed increased by 100,000 and our society was divided into pro Lawrence Fox. Uh, no, we, 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 we liked Meghan because her exotic DNA. We, we liked the fact that she was giving us uh, kudos for being cool because her mother was black. It, it, it reflected well on us. A lot of people thought um, we liked her wedding and, and you supported her enormously. We're not racist against those who say if Meghan has left and she thought we were racist, we are racist. So here we are again. We have these two. We have these two things: personal autonomy versus groupthink. And Lawrence Fox then went on to say that he discovered he couldn't date. He's very attractive, handsome um, uh, film star, and he said he couldn't date women under thirty-five because uh, all the women under thirty-five were part of the group think he was going along the road with one woman he quite fancied and uh, he'd met and she suddenly said that Gillette commercial that that demasculinizing Gillette commercial I'm sure people remember it yes. wasn't that wonderful wasn't that wonderful and he got he stopped her and he said our relationship ends here it's, it's, it's <laughs> there is no future for us you're not looking for a man you're looking for, no, no, uh, you're looking, you're looking for <laughs> someone androgynous now the reason i say this is that if someone like lawrence fox casually and and playfully observes that a whole generation under 35 are part of this anti-patriarchal anti-personal responsibility groupthink we've lost the culture wars in an enormous way because it's much harder to tell these people about Jesus than it would be to tell people who are not part of it. But the first thing you, you have to accept to come to Jesus is that your life doesn't add up, you're personally accountable, and you need a savior. But, but if it's not your life that doesn't add up, it's your society that doesn't add up. And if you're not accountable as a person, you're only accountable as part of the group. So it's not you, it's the group. And anyway, it's all the fault of those white cisgendered men. Then you don't get to be saved. So I think what Lawrence Fox is telling us is that, that in, our, in our agenda for evangelism, we're a very long way behind the curve. And the people under 35 are not able to hear the good news and respond in the way they would do if they had not been brainwashed by this culture that was led by feminism that is responsible for the ordination of women, close brackets. Uh, <laughs> and therefore, there's a very close link between orthodox apostolic biblical theology and the way in which we do evangelism. And the way in which we do evangelism will change the nature of the societies we live in. That's that's the dotted line and the, it's the, the sort of causality, George, that I was trying to reach for earlier on. One of the most haunting parts of watching YouTube videos is the what I call the man on the street interviews. And uh, Jay Leno, a famous uh, talk show host here in America, made them famous about uh, 15 years ago, where he'd walk down the street with a microphone or have one of his producers or somebody in the office do it and ask somebody under 35 a question about American culture. Who is the vice president of America? <laughs> uh, 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 what's Name one amendment in the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, you know, and who's the son of God? Uh, uh, you know, it gets worse and worse because it's not like he ever found somebody who knew anything. In general, there's been a, a vast dumbing down of culture worldwide. It's not just an American issue. It's a, it's a Western issue where people who are in charge of our education system, our public education system, have chosen not to have higher education, but the lowest common denominator education. 
what do I have to do to get this kid through school so that uh, the numbers look good and the college will at least accept him or give him a chance? Now, I say this because we used to live in Thomaston, Connecticut, an upper middle class community uh, about uh, 25 miles north of here where I live now, where the Val Victorian of the public school could barely get into University of Connecticut in stores. That's, that's unfathomable. And so it's true. We've dumbed down culture. We've dumbed down children under 35. The worst part is the people above 35 don't want to get involved. Yeah, they, they, they sit and they watch what's happening and uh, don't bother me. I don't want to be bothered with it. I don't want to watch TV anymore. I don't want to watch the news anymore. I just, I, I can't believe what's happening. It's dystopian as it, it always was going to be, but I don't want to be bothered. And so we as a church are kind of left in the middle here of people who don't care or people who've just lost their, their sense of education. Ke Kevin, it's not uh, in the church that from a pastor's perspective, a minister's perspective, we see this in the great difficulty in finding volunteers to do things, to teach Sunday schools, to lead youth movements, to cut the grass. But it's not just in churches. I read a very discouraging article put out by the City Journal about the ranks of volunteer firemen. The vast majority of fire departments in the United States are staffed solely by volunteers who raise the money to buy equipment, who respond to fires and emergencies. It's only the big cities and the more wealthy incorporated areas that have professional firefighters. What we've seen in the last 20 years is a decline by three quarters of the number of people willing to be volunteer firemen. It's what, and so the, so within this community, they're asking themselves, what are we doing wrong? How are we not reaching young people? How, why would, uh, people 25 years ago in their 30s and 40s feel that this was a worthy way to spend one evening and a week at you know at classes learning how to do firefighting and today nobody is interested so it's it's as you as you've said kevin this is a transnational trans cultural trans group issue of people's lack of community cohesion of fellowship uh we're getting into uh, the little girl who played Hermione Granger, Emma Watson, was famously in the news a month or so ago by saying that she's almost 30 and she's decided she's not going to marry, she's going to marry herself because that's the only way that she can really ever find personal fulfillment is through being, I don't know, being solely a unique person. No, by redefining single. Mm -hmm. You know, all of this comes from back to the, what the uh, reporter asked Gavin, what's it all about? Well, in, in the, the end here, it's about whether or not God is allowed to define what man is. God is allowed to define what woman is. God is allowed to define what church is. God is allowed to define what salvation is. We as humans don't like his definition. We want to change it. And we change it from pay. We, we change it in everything, and therefore the culture has lost, because we want to redefine everything God created. Well, you want to end the show there? That's a great quote. What? Mm. Oh no. <laughs> no, but I think we need to actually speak because I, sometimes we are criticized in the comments for painting such a gloomy picture, not offering a vision forward or a way forward. And I, I think it might behoove us to offer okay, now what? What do we do? And I'll give you my quick George answer, which is show up to church on Sunday and get on your knees and pray. Because that's how I've seen lives changed and people changed and the world changes through not by political log rolling or human lobbying, but by the power of God acting in the world. Get Go to church, get on your knees, pray. And, and, and be faithful. I, during this last week, I... Um... Uh, I, I think I said something slightly embarrassed as I'm as I, I, I move my homilies to, to to what my bishop says must be called Catholic catechesis, and I think I said something slightly self-pitying, like like I've no idea if there's anybody out there anymore. I, I got an email from a criminal law barrister uh, who wrote, say, um, 
I, I was a cultural Christian. I, I didn't, didn't really believe in Jesus. And I came across your website after you did a podcast with a man called James Dillingpole. So I looked on your website. I've been listening to your sermons. And I found myself uh, a short while ago on my knees in the middle of the night asking Jesus into my heart as, as my savior. And I'm now teaching my children the faith. I'm slightly worried I'm, I'm, I'm signing them up for, for persecution later on because I get what's happening. Uh, but, but, but thank you for for, for your website and I, I mean i had i don't know how many sermons i've preached but you know I'd, I'd have preached every single one of them just for this one man <laughs> to come to jesus if i'd known that was going to happen and and robert gagnon put up something on facebook just yesterday saying his wife went into a store and uh, the woman said gagnon mrs gagnon you're not related to robert gagnon are you and she very embarrassed because she thought she might be. <laughs> said, said yes he's my husband and and his this woman said please thank him I, I was a I was a lesbian engaged in 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 a subculture of lesbianism that made me deeply unhappy. And because of what he wrote, uh, I, I'm a Christian who's free of lesbianism now. And would you do you thank your husband? He and Jesus have turned my life around. Now, I, these are just just two episodes that have come up this last week, and it's not because Bob Gagnon or, or I are particularly uh, anything at all, except that you know, as 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 we as we do Anglican Unscripted, as George preaches sermons, as, as Kevin talks about Jesus as he goes around his, his work and, and I do my own form of wittering, um, the Holy Spirit gets to work. So I think George is absolutely right. What can we do? We, we, we keep, we say our prayers, we read the Bible, we keep the faith and we, we do church in whatever form the Holy Spirit has brought us to do it. And it helps to have a big picture okay this is 2000 years of christianity this is not the worst it's ever been okay uh, our brothers and sisters who come before us uh the patriarchs of the church you know the first 11 were martyred uh have you know certainly had a rougher time than us in our comfy houses that are kept at a nice comfy 68 degrees except for george what do you keep your temperature at down there george in florida 74 74 and so um we have a, a different understanding of what the, our forefathers and the the christians who came before us do about uh comfort and western and culture and to say this is the worst of the worst it, it's getting worse but uh we can learn from those who come before us where it was much worse i'd like to do a little uh semi-commercial announcement and it's exactly on this issue okay and one of the reasons why i'm hopeful and optimistic i had a friend who is a interim priest at a very fashionable church in a resort community in the far west and he said george the parish is starting their search process it's an episcopal church and they're looking for a unicorn oh, no. and i said what's a unicorn that's a horse with a, a point on its head horn horn horn, horn. <laughs> And he said, this is a very orthodox church, meaning it adheres to uh, believe the virgin birth, it believes in the incarnation, it follows traditional teachings on human ethics and morality, but we're in a very liberal diocese, and we're in a very socially liberal, fashionable community. So George, I need you to help me find a priest, and we want somebody young with children in their 40s or something. So I want you to find me a priest who is Orthodox through and through, but will have no problem with half of his congregation being Bernie brothers, uh, Bernie Sanders supporters. Now, here's, here's the thing uh, where I'm encouraged that if places like this fashionable mountain resort community uh, still have cells of orthodoxy that are looking to expand, that are looking to grow, that haven't rolled over and died, I think if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. So, friends, if you do know any unicorn Episcopal priests who want to uh, move to a fashionable place, uh, let me know. Uh, I'll, your email will be in the in the uh, notes section of the show. Uh, I can't. Kind of, you're much too old for them. I'm, uh, yeah, you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm too uh, old for them. Uh, in case you guys didn't catch it, I've kind of relaunched the uh, ten minute topic. Uh, if you guys have any ideas of topics you want to hear about or people you want to hear about, including George and Gavin, uh, where we just uh, hash out a, a, 
uh, relatable westernized Christian topic in 10 minutes, let me know. Uh, AnglicanTV at gmail.com. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 568 of Anglican Unscripted on what is still the 21st of January 2019.